Um, welcome everybody to um, the Curriculum Committee Working Group of the Board of Education. This morning, our topic is core extension. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Mioli for an introduction on the topic. Oh, I forgot the pledge already again. I do this every time. First, we're gonna say the pledge and then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Mioli for an introduction. Um, let me just give you a flag. All right. Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Um, I think the pledge alone is a lesson in how what you learn in school can be in your brain forever. <laughs> Dr. Bioli, will you go ahead and um, introduce this topic for us? I will, thank you. <clears throat> I guess note to self, maybe I should do the pledge next time. So we just have one, one introduction. It's fine um, with me. <laughs> yeah. Except I don't know if I can do the flag thing. I would have to actually be able to manipulate the technology. Anyway. We can do it with teamwork. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, as I think everyone knows, the, uh, the curriculum committee topic today is Weber Middle School's core extension. And... Um, Beth, you can forward to the next slide. And we have our curriculum committee members and we have uh, Ms. Javelin, who is a Weber Middle School principal, uh, Mr. Saccone, who is the uh, one of the assistant principals. Um, and um, I think we have another guest with us, but I'll let Ms. Javelin introduce him uh, when we get there. Uh, next slide. So as usual, um, this is the last curriculum committee meeting this year and on all of them, I've tried to give a little bit of a, an historical perspective and also a kind of tried to tie everything into curriculum instruction and assessment, which is what this is all about. Um, so um, just so you know, uh, Weber Junior High School uh, was converted to a middle school in 1995 and I actually chaired the district committee, co-chaired the district committee um, that ran the curriculum changes uh, starting in 1993. Um, and so we turned a 7-8 junior high school into a 6-7-8 middle school. Um, and there was a lot of that going on at the time. And the, the basic focus was to try and make junior high schools less like little high schools and more like, um, you know, an adolescent friendly uh, institution that comes somewhere between elementary school and high school. Um, and there was a lot written at the time, a lot of uh, things that were um, adopted as best practices. Um, and in fact, part of the bond that occurred in the early 90s was to physically redo Weber uh, into a house structure. Um, so many of the, the things that were included in that shift, in that historical shift from a junior high to a middle school uh, was uh, included house structure, which was to have smaller learning communities, um, more integrated instruction. And we've talked about that and in, in earlier curriculum meetings, staff student connections, the focus on adolescence and engagement and giving kids a wide range of activities um, and, and catering more to their interests to try to make things um, more relevant to them, particularly um, at these age group levels. Um, we had two um, consultants who worked with us fairly extensively, Nancy Doda and Thomas Gusky, both of, who, both of whom are still uh, writing and teaching and uh, consulting. Um, and actually Nancy Doda came uh, to help open up our new middle school uh, in 1995 with a, a, an evening meeting where we invited all of the parents to come. And many of the things that I just kind of very briefly went over were included in that introduction um, from Dr. Doda. Um, so um, that's really all that I want to um, say. Um, the core extension was, um, was one of the pieces that the committee looked at very carefully. Um, and I will say it's been a, it's been a while, it's been uh, um, 16 or 17 years. 
Uh, and so core extension has evolved. Um, but the basic idea of the word core and encore, those two words, um, was to, again, make a little bit of a differentiation between the high school terms, academics and specials. Um, and the term encore was, um, was coined to refer to the time, uh, I'm sorry, the core extension was referred to the time where um, students would be in their core classes, but it would be an extension of what was going on already. And it was a time period that was specifically created for pullouts. So in other words, one of the things that the committee was looking to avoid was having students who go to PEP, uh, resource room, uh, various other um, uh, interventions and uh, enrichments um, so that they would not miss their core or their encore uh, classes for the most part. So it was, it was a big part of the rescheduling that occurred at the time. Um, if we can go to the next slide, um, I will uh, finish my introduction. Um, this is a great article by Nancy Dota. It was written last year, almost exactly a year ago. <clears throat> um, and um, as I said, she's still, she's dedicated almost her entire career to middle school education. Um, and I just wanna read a couple of lines from this. It's a, it's a great article. Um, but it's, the title is Relationships and Relevance Once Again. And I just wanna read a couple of uh, lines from here. What has taken shape in the world with COVID-19 has given me pause to wonder what matters most in life and as an educator, a chance to query about what matters most in education. I am quite sure that for all of us, the COVID-19 pandemic is uncomfortable, disruptive, scary, and deeply saddening. Now, I've been a middle school educator for decades, trying in one capacity or another to ensure the growth and well being of young adolescents. In those years, I have observed that our habitual patterns of schooling all too often undervalue the two most powerful needs of this age group and perhaps the two most influential variables in student learning and life relationships and relevance. And very briefly, I want to pull out a paragraph about relationships that she wrote about. Relationships have always been touted as the number one priority in middle school education, and for good reason. They express um, uh, a longing to be back at school. Kids during COVID-19 expressed a longing to be back at school, not because they yearned for that lesson on igneous rocks or the elements of fictions or the Dust Bowl. They were eager to be with others. And she goes on, and I won't, um, I won't give you any more of that, but I just want to highlight one or two lines um, on relevance. Right now, as a civilization, we are facing a world challenge of grave importance. It has nudged many of us to question much of what we once took for granted. On the school front, educators and students alike are experiencing in sometimes painful ways a hard truth about the school learning. When stripped of the trappings of school life, including lunch with friends, sports, proms, graduations, what is left is sometimes not all that compelling. Students talk of missing friends and teachers, but algebra apparently is not that memorable. Over the past several decades, educators have used the word relevance to capture a sought after quality in school learning. And all of us know this truth. Knowledge stays with us when we need it, Yet so much of school knowledge is given to students without relevance. Content without a cause is content lost. That's just a few lines from this article, but I, I thought it set the stage well uh, for a lot of the things that you're about to see. So I will uh, turn the virtual mic over to Ms. Javelin. Hi, everybody. So what is core extension? I mean, Dr. Milley really took the show away, but some of the things that's really important um, that it gives us um, in the schedule is not just about this one period, it's about the whole day. So one of the things in the middle school that we do um, is we tie English and social studies together and we could teach double periods. 
We have not seen that much of that this year because of COVID, but often our doors are open and we're doing interdisciplinary units between English and social studies. At times we will do a double math period where the science teachers will hold students longer or vice versa. And we do this, um, and this period helps us by being able to do back-to-back -back coursework in English and in social studies or in math and science. So we can get double periods for longer lessons, more in-depth learning, et cetera. Um, Part of core extension is also about folks focusing on the social emotional needs. It's a place where we connect as teachers to students, students to students, um, and where we really get to know students on a different level. We're able to talk to them more uh, freely because we're not de delivering a curriculum. Um, more students have time to investigate different, um, different items for lack of a better word they can do research and you're going to see some examples of some activities that we've done through core extension um, but during the time when students are actually doing their projects uh, staff is able to sit and meet and talk with students often you get to talk to them about different things not just subject matter material throughout it during this period students get to explore different topics that are not in the curriculum that are not new york state driven curriculum and it's student, often student focused. So um, for example, I've been in a Mr. Dowling, maybe we'll talk about this the other, later on, but I've been in a room where he was discussing homework and you know they were doing a debate on homework. That's not necessarily something that ha would happen in a core classroom, but it, during this time we could bring relevance to topics of interest for students. Um, it is often teacher interest and student interest uh, things that, that cannot get done in a classroom that is above and beyond the New York State curriculum, it's a time where teachers have the opportunity to teach that within this period. There's also a tremendous amount of flexibility. So if students need to make up any test work or classwork or need a, an additional, um, some time for some um, additional work, they could go speak to their core extension teacher and then they could go visit another teacher during this time. It is also when we have our AI, AIS support so even if you're not in an AIS support class, um, students may be able to go and get some help with math for that period or some reading for that period um, in order to catch up. It's also where our PEP program comes from, um, as well as some of our other classes, which I'll go through um, in another slide. And then it's a time where it's a little bit more relaxed, where since there are no grades, students and teachers are both more relaxed and further instruction can happen. Um, the important piece is not everyone has core, and, core extension, but are supported in similar ways through different support classes. Mr. Sacconi. Thank you. <coughs> the video play, Beth. Beth, can you uh, click play on the video quickly? Dan, it's playing. There's just no sound. It's oh. playing on my end. You, did you guys, you didn't hear it? No sound. Try it again. Try it again because you were muted. Maybe. You hear it now? Okay. So I just wanted to uh, share that with everyone. And I apologize, I can't see anything on my screen. For some reason, the Zoom feature isn't working today. But the uh, one of the big pieces of, of core extension that our teachers talk about on a regular basis is this ability to reinforce that nature of being a community, a school community, a learning community. Uh, that little intro that you just saw was something students created two years ago each year. Uh, in the greenhouse for sixth graders, we have a uh, talent show. We actually have it twice a year. And um, it allows students during core extension, they take about a week and they start to work with peers on coming up with the entire production. We usually host it in the auditorium. Uh, some students get assigned to be the ones who create the, uh, 
the intro video and host and MC, and they're working with other students who are their writers who are helping them come up with one lines and zingers to introduce each act. Other students are working on their acts and to watch and see the ability for these students who are gonna to be together for the next three years. Um, the beginning of sixth grade is, is a hard transition for most students. You're coming from multiple environments and you're trying to be put together into this new um, classroom setting and, and figure out where you fit in. And when we go through this exercise and start to see kids come out of their shell and feel like they can start to show off um, their talents. We had, for instance, during that one year, a student who uh, had to started suffering a lot through um, having nervous tics and in class he was, he was, he was struggling. And when he sat down for the talent show and started playing classical piano beautifully, no, none of the students had ever would ever have thought that that was one of his, his skills. And it helped him to come out and feel connected and, and feel proud of something. And so that's a big part of what we try to do as a team and in a house structure. And the core extension course gives us that flexibility as both Dr. Mioli and Ms. Javelin said, to come up with opportunities to do that. For instance, today, uh, the yellow house and the green house are competing against each other in uh, kickball tournaments during their core extension class that they had to earn everyone completing all of their, their homeworks and their other classes. Then once everybody's coaching each other through, get everything in so we can all compete. Now we're having Mr. Mace and I out there with them playing kickball today, ninth period, which should be interesting because I didn't bring sneakers. But um, you know, hopefully we come through because they're all dressed in their green and they're all pumped up. And that's a big part of them feeling like they're connected to something. And so it goes back to the idea of connecting uh, to each individual student, helping them to work through the different social and emotional um, learning experiences that, that come about in middle school, which are many. Um, and we see that when it's less structured and you see little nuances about students' personalities come out and then the team will, of teachers will start to talk about that. And I, I can't tell you how many situations arise in a core extension setting where teachers say, you know, I noticed that such and such isn't engaging or that these two students seem to, to not get along or don't work well together. And then that uh, activates either myself or a guidance counselor to bring them in and start coaching them and helping them um, navigate some of those challenges. You don't always see that in a structured class setting, you know, for all the reasons that Dr. Muley had mentioned before. We have, um, uh, you know, curriculum restraints, we have time restraints, we, uh, students are a little bit more grade focused. Taking that piece out of the equation really helps them to feel like they can engage in a different way. Um, a lot of what they do in core extension is team-based approach. They try to work on student soft skills, interacting with peers. It's not how you, what you say, it's how you say it to each other. What does it mean to be collaborative and work in a constructive way? Um, a big piece of it is the risks and the comfortability with taking risks. We challenge students to, um, you know, try experiments and be okay with failure and say, look, you know, this is okay. Let's figure out how to rebuild it or let's go out and survey people and try to get a better understanding of what they feel about things. Just recently, I had students coming to me trying to trick me to see which water tastes better, the tap water from the school or Poland Spring. And they went around and surveyed everybody and they were both tap water trying to create this narrative that they're now going to write about how um, we're, you know, impression, you know, labels impression us and, and change our perspective on things. Those are, are the flight, that flexibility is what lets students start to own what they're learning and have those real life experiences. Um, and it also lets them explore things that they're curious about. And that, I think that's the biggest um, positive that we're seeing is that, you know, the students, when they feel engaged and that they're owning what they're doing, they, they, they show up. We've had many situations during the pandemic where students were shutting their cameras off remotely during uh, lessons, but in core extension, they're turned on because they're interacting with their, their friends in these smaller groups. Um, the, you know, authentic learning experiences, you know, you can't hit on that enough. That's where students really come alive. And then a big piece is digital literacy. I know this year has forced us to, to really embrace that a little bit differently, but this is something that I personally have pushed for years. And uh, one of the things I saw this year, um, and it, that, that little intro video you saw speaks to it, um, we live in a digital world. And so we've pushed at Weber for our sixth graders to all learn um, digital design, digital video production, so that they can take those skills. We, we introduce it through the technology and, and with our general music program. 
uh, and now a little bit with our art programs, but they take those skills and they apply it outside of what they're learning. And that's the big piece that we're trying to reinforce with students is that you're learning skills that you can now use to communicate and express yourself and be connected to the world. It's not that I'm in a specific class for 43 minutes and everything that I'm doing now doesn't apply once I leave and go on to the next subject area. And core extension is where they get to blend all of that together. And now adding that digital literacy, we have classes all over the building where kids are making public service announcements and different projects using those skill sets that they're learning in other classes and bringing it all together. Um, and I know we have some teachers we'll talk about, it, so I don't want to talk too much because I'll, I'll go on for a while. But um, I will, you know, that, that, that's kind of the gist of what you don't see when you just look at it from a curriculum standpoint. Thank you, Mr. Sconey. So how does core, core extension fit into the Weber schedule? So this data is not from this year, it's from last year. Um, I used last year's data just because it was more of a normal year. And with COVID, we chose to do pods. So things got a little different. But core extension generally is an every other day class. Students have two different teachers for core extension. They have an A day teacher and a B day teacher. It's two different subjects. Um, they have it for the year. Um, and other have it for one day and some don't take core extension at all. And this is just a, a general viewing of what happens and how many students take it for two days. Some students take it for three days because they don't get certain classes. Um, and students that don't take it for any days is because they have other classes um, that they take, which I believe is my next slide. So I'm gonna just go to the next slide for a second. Um, if I don't take core extension, why not? I'm a PEP student. I'm a PEP 6 student and I have PEP every other day. So I only have core extension every other day. I'm a special ed student and I get my services such as resource room strategies for learning instead of core extension. I get my AIS classes, ELA workshop or math workshop during this time. I'm an earth science student. So I have lab every other day. So I don't get core extension. I'm a double skip math student and I take some classes at the high school. So I don't get core extension. So these are just some of the reasons why students uh, um, won't get core extension. And this is where Dr. Mila was saying, these would all be pull out programs. And if these students, if we didn't have the core extension, these students would be pulled out of music, phys ed, um, art, tech, facts. And this provides us, this program provides us for that not to happen by having these classes in effect. So students don't have to choose by not taking one of those, um, but because of the classes they have to take, they don't lose other um, encore classes that would be exciting to them. So I'm happy to say that we have three staff members that are going to talk about programs. We have a sixth grade, Mr. Smith, um, sixth grade ELA teacher. We have Mr. Dowling, a, sixth, a seventh grade social studies teacher, sorry. And we have Ms. Uh, Lynn Stadt-Arco, who is an eighth grade science teacher. And we also have a student, um, Helena Burke, who's going to talk about um, core extension from a student's view. So we'll start with Mr. Smith. Good morning, can you hear me? It was a little choppy, but I tr speak again and I think we'll. Good morning, can you hear me? Should I go to Mr. Tony's office? Or you might wanna, to yeah, we're, you're coming in um, choppy. So uh, this is my core extension class. We're finishing up a discussion on the web address code. I'm going to go to Mr. Sacconi's office to see if this will work. Jordan, you can finish up, and I'll be back in a minute. Can I do it in your office? Uh, there, there, just can yeah. you just to go. Mr. Adlin, you want to go to uh, Mr. Dowling first? Or no? Want to just wait? Or no? Should, so, Mr. Dowling, uh, Mr. Dowling, do you want to go first and we'll hold off on Mr. Smith and I'll go second? You have to unmute yourself. He is unmuted, but I don't. We don't hear him. 
Yeah. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Oh, I got nervous. If we were over for two, that would have been bad news. All right, good. So do we. <laughs> okay. Uh, just to give you a sense of how uh, important I think uh, core extension is, when uh, Mrs. Javelin first approached me to speak at this meeting, I initially said no, uh, because in order to be here with you, I had to miss my core extension class. So, you know, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a very serious class. Um, my goal when, when I, you know, set up my program is to, you know, enrich what we're learning in our classroom, um, provide opportunities to develop writing skills, um, thinking skills, just generally speaking, uh, study skills. Uh, you know, if there are different study uh, uh, ideas that we can come up with that maybe they can put into the educational toolbox and use later on. I think that's helpful. Vocabulary. Um, I want to uh, help them become better people. They meet new kids uh, when sometimes these different groups uh, will, will mix. And I also focus a lot on reading. Uh, students don't always like to read on their own, so you know we can get them some opportunities to read uh, within the classroom. So I typically divide our core, my core extension program into four different themes, and those change from year to year. Some years I feel this something's more important than others, so I'll, I'll swap things in or out. Uh, in the past, uh, I've done a uh, like a, almost like a quarter long. Uh, topic, and again, we meet every other day, but a topic on current events or the American Revolution, study skills and critical thinking, historical fiction. I've done one on something that I call a writing lab. We do just a lot of different uh, writing um, activities, and then, you know, they get peer feedback and feedback from uh, the teacher as well. Um, so just in a typical year, you um, I may do a unit on uh, current events. They will read articles from Junior Scholastic, articles from uh, newspapers. We will uh, watch short news clips and then have discussions based on what we see there. I think that's where Ms. Javelin ended up seeing that um, little debate that we had going on or group discussion on uh, homework. Um, and these, what's great about the, this topic is it can go in any direction. So we could end up reading an article. I remember reading an article once on Egypt. And before I knew it, we were having discussions on uh, the Cold War and the Holocaust. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, they had questions. Let's, you know, let's answer the questions or different topics that they want to talk about. Um, and, you know, I'm not looking at the clock going, how am I going to finish this lesson? It's okay. We can finish it the next time. I, I don't have the pressure. And then as an extension, the students don't have the pressure either of worrying about, you know, you know we're not going to finish or they're not going to be ready for a test or anything like that. Um, then the next quarter, it could be something like what I title read, read, read. And when you're tired, read some more. Uh, that would include reading some uh, books like uh, Nothing But the Truth by Avi or Zane and the Hurricane, which is, is a great story and also has uh, a diverse cast of characters. Uh, we will take a trip to the library and students will self-select, uh, for instance, uh, a historical fiction book. They'll do some silent reading in class with a few writing assignments. Uh, and then that would even culminate with a very short uh, presentation in front of the class. Um, we, in years past, we've even read Johnny Tremaine, which is a really tough book. Um, we've also done a, let's say a third topic would be the American Revolution. We'll watch the musical and discuss the musical 1776. Uh, it is not just as sometimes I like to refer to it when I tell them it's not going to be cinema one. We're not just going to turn this on and eat popcorn. Uh, we're going to stop and we're going to discuss things. And I always like to tell the kids I have the record for the fastest. I, I started a lesson once going, all right, I'm not going to stop the video. I want you to see a lot of this today. Three seconds later, I stopped the video because I had to clarify something. So uh, it's definitely not going to be we're just watching videos. Um, we read excerpts from David McCullough's 1776. That's pretty difficult stuff to read. So we really have to go through that slowly. 
um, the students have uh, written essays on uh, who they believe should be the father of the American Revolution. So a lot of different, um, even some games that we uh, do to review some of the stuff that we've learned in our uh, core class. Fourth quarter is almost always uh, the topic of slavery. Uh, we read the slave narratives from uh, to be a slave. Uh, sometimes we do that with books on tape. Sometimes they read with partners. Sometimes we read as a whole group. Sometimes we read independently. We kind of mix that up. Um, each day before we start reading, we highlight one notable African-American in history. So we get about 15 of those but in, in the time that we are reading the book. So it's not just, you know, reading about slavery for 40 minutes would be, you know, it's, it's tough. It's really tough to do. So highlighting some positive aspects about cultural things or, or just, just, just positive uh, people. Uh, so we end up having people from LeVar Burton to uh, Larry Doby, Thurgood Marshall, uh, and the list goes on and on. So often, by the way, people that are, you know, not the ones that everyone has learned throughout the years, like a Jackie Robinson or, um, you know, Rosa Parks, you know, there's certain people that everyone knows about. I want to kind of like dig a little deeper. Um, we also listen to some music. Uh, we uh, watch a documentary from Henry Louis Gates Jr., which also brings in a lot of uh, the cultural component. Um, that's um, thing, things often that they are, um, the students are often unaware of, which is, which is great. Um, and I don't want to go on too long either, but uh, I'll just close with what a student uh, one said to me about my core extension class. He said, you know, a lot of people think that this is core extension, but it's actually core, he emphasized core extension. Um, and, you know, that's, that's my goal every single day is to make it meaningful and, you know, worthwhile to the students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dowling. Mr. Smith, are you ready to go? I hope so. Oh, uh, we're good. I can hear you. Great. Um, I'm sorry about the uh, technology earlier. Um, I was actually in my core extension class. We were discussing Weber's dress code, so I'm curious to see what they've decided. Uh, so I just want to start off by, my name is Gardner Smith. I am the sixth grade English teacher in the Blue House. Uh, I wanted to highlight some of the activities we do in core extension, and then I wanted to share some thoughts on why core extension is such a vital part of my students' experiences here at Weber. Some of the more exciting projects we've done involve grants through the Ed Foundation and HEARTS. Uh, for example, we've worked with Sonia Aurora, who's a local writer and activist. Uh, we've written poems with social justice, social justice themes with her. We've, uh, we've created local video news stories in core extension with Debbie Rudinsky. She's a Port Washington parent and a video editor with ABC News. We've written songs with Lucy Kaplansky, a professional singer songwriter whose music is often played on WFEV. So um, some wonderful projects we've done uh, over the last several years. Uh, all of these experiences have been wonderful, have, have been wonderful opportunities for our students. And you know, I'd like to thank the generosity of the Ed Foundation and Hearts for making them possible. But uh, due to time and budget constraints, the every other day model of core extension with its smaller class sizes uh, has been ideal for these programs to be really successful with these kids. Beyond these programs, in sixth grade, core extension really lends itself well to what I'm doing in my core English classes. Uh, in core extension, for example, during our memoir unit, we read and discuss excerpts of memoirs by people from diverse backgrounds, such as Linda Blackman Lowry, Gary Soto, Ibn Hajj Muhammad, Kyoko Mori, Saru Brierly, and Diane Guerrero. We get to take walks in their shoes and, and really spend some quality time discussing their life experiences. In core extension during our fiction unit, we read and discuss short stories from the junior grade books program. Using the Socratic method, we explore together why the characters do what they do, and we go deep into the heart of human nature. And the discussions are, are always fascinating. Um, no matter how, how many times I've read a story, uh, kids find new ways to, to experience it and share their, 
share their uh, observations and ideas. Uh, right now in core extension during our persuasive writing unit, we read news articles and opinion pieces on topics such as racism, transgender athletes, the pros and cons of social media, and the benefits and pitfalls of testing and grading students. Like I mentioned earlier, my students were currently discussing Weber's dress code, the fairness and unfairness of it in their opinion. And uh, I'm curious to see you know, how it all turned out when I get back in a few minutes. I do wanna say though, that the greatest advantage of core extension is that I get to know my students better. My time with these students is doubled compared to just having them for English core. With smaller class sizes, because some of them are pulled out for other programs, the quieter ones in core extension are freer to participate. And everyone is freer to learn without the pressure of yet another curriculum, yet another teacher, yet another report card grade. Sixth graders, as you probably know, experience a tremendous upheaval coming from elementary school. And core extension really helps them adjust as well as any class, perhaps even better, in order to, feel, to have them feel a sense of belonging. Um, in core extension, there's more opportunity to connect with smaller classes, to learn about each other's strengths and challenges, and really to grow together. And that's why I really value core Go extension. Ahead, sir, you want? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Lindstadt. Hi, how are, how are you? Um, thank you for, for having me here and inviting me to share a little bit about what we're able to do in core extension, uh, eighth grade science focus. So for me, core extension really is an opportunity to have this make choice and to um, let me know what they're interested in learning more out so I can uh, find opportunities for them to dive a little deeper than the curriculum might allow in terms of timing. So a um, very concrete example, uh, my eighth grade core extension kids this year um, were discussing how they were upset that they didn't get to make ice cream last year and that they didn't get to so Miss Lindstadt, maybe um, take your camera off. Miss Lindstadt, let me know those things sprung right into action, and we actually have a baby chicks downstairs. But it wasn't just about hatching the chicks. We learned about chicken embryology and the developmental process. So we were able to go deeper into an agricultural. How's that? Any better? Probably not. Yeah, it's better without, it's better with your screen off. If maybe you want to go to our sixth grade student. Okay. So, um, like I was saying, we were able to do an agricultural lens um, where, where we hashed chicks and learned about the uh, embryology to tie into uh, the, the, their desire to work a little bit with creating ice cream. Uh, we partnered with New York Agricultural um, in the New York Agriculture in the classroom, and we're actually in the process of working uh, from cow to cone. So my kids are are getting exposure to um, scientific fields that aren't necessarily very visible here on Long Island where they live. And our end product will be their, their ice cream creation, which they are uh, very interested in. You know, having an opportunity to really spend a little more time building on core science curriculum is um, amazing to be able to do with my core extension kids. We can make those igneous rocks more relevant by um, focusing on our now park systems where the kids have an opportunity to choose um, a park that they're interested in. They can dive deeper into um, the, the understanding and the geology of that park. 
and they create informational brochures to encourage other people to maybe look a little deeper into a location on our earth in our country that they're not um, familiar familiar with. Core extension has also been a great opportunity to do some um, product based learning. Um, I have a lot of different contests that our kids have entered throughout the year, but it's not simply a throw in an entry on, you know, for, for this watershed poster contest. We learn about watershed and specifically where are they, where we live on Long Island. And then we take that information and we, we um, apply it to the contest that we, we might enter. Um, they worked with like Cup Cuppy where our kids have actually um, developed their own teams within the core extension group. They have done research and developed um, a product that they actually produce and then market. And all of that information is sent um, and then they're judged against Carrie Ann, um, we're having a lot of trouble understanding you. to to really focus on an end product work towards that end product. Carrie Ann, I don't know if you can hear me, but we're having a lot of trouble hearing you. Um Ms. Javelin, if, I don't know if we can go to this to the student. Sure. So I'm gonna let Helene go and then Thanks. we'll and then sorry Carrie Ann. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Helene Burke and I am in Green 6. Today I will be talking about Core Extension. Core Extension is a class that extends from other core classes like English, Social Studies, and Science. I liked Core Extension because it was a fun way of learning without the stress of being graded. We had time to discover closer friendships, work together, and have a different perspective of learning. Here are some things that we did in Core Extension. In English Core Extension, our English teacher, Miss Burgess, picked a person for us to study for Women's African American Heritage Month. It was very exciting to study someone and learn about what they did in life. In Science Core Extension, we made cars built with elastic potential energy. It was so cool building things with our hands. Well, bad part is my car broke a couple times. We also did football and science. Our green six science teacher, Ms. Sook, chose to do football because Ms. Sook wanted to see collaboration and teamwork. <laughs> Lastly, Ms. Sook put us into groups of two or three, and we had to choose a question about life and make data, kind of like a science fair. It was so much fun testing people. Lastly, in social studies core extension, we did some pretty cool things. We got to pick a country, research it, and make a brochure about its economy, geography, religion, products, and places of interest. It was lots of fun. We also read some interesting Greek myths. And the coolest part was that they were learning Greece in social studies. So it was kind of like a review. And we also got to make our own myths, which was awesome. Finally, we read three Chinese stories that all came together in the end. My class got to act out some of the characters, and we laughed a lot. Core Extension was so much fun, and I hope you enjoy this speech. Have a nice day. I should have just had her do the whole thing. I didn't have to do any of this. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so just quickly, I, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna talk much about this, just a matter of time, but these are just some of the examples of some things that happen in Core Extension. So in addition to our tech program, we also do aerodynamics design. We build, we test, we configure kites um, in, in core extension. Uh, we do our uh, whole study about Holocaust. Um, for those of you that have been in Weber in the middle of the building, we have butterflies that we the kids actually make and paint. So this is just an example um, with what we do 
uh, and we do this through core extension and we tie it to our social studies classes. This is, ooh, this is, um, so the students worked and uh, Mr. Sconey touched upon this on our PSA announcements. So there was one on mass safety, um, which I'm not gonna just show in uh, the nature of time, but this is just the students working on that in their groups. Um, we do uh, this core extension, they did um, a digital eye search presentation where they selected topics they wanted to learn about and then they presented them. So they worked on many different skills here. Um, am I showing this Mr. Mioli, this part? Yeah, I think I think you can, I think okay. it's great. Okay, so this was something that Blue 7 worked on um, through core extension. So they worked on six word memoirs about this year. So I'm just gonna show you um, what students said about this past year. I'm going to I'm going to pause this. There's a, a few more minutes of this, but this was something clearly that they were able to work on through core extension and um, connect with kids. Um, it also gives us a way sometimes to connect with students um, and see concerns that we may have. So again, students were able to make ice cream through core extension um, and they made ice cream in a bag working in groups. Uh, some some students did research presentations. How do we know what is in our uh, drinking water. So they literally surveyed Port Washington drinking water and did presentations on that. And I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Mioli. All right, so for those of you who are curriculum committee junkies and have been watching, uh, uh, binge watching curriculum committee meetings, um, these all these terms sound familiar and you just heard um, uh, all of them many times, integrated instruction meeting student needs, acceleration and support, um, authentic real world assessment, focus on social and emotional learning, innovation and viability. And I'll end with the two words that I started with, and that is relationships and relevance. And that's our presentation. Um, thank you, Dr. Mioli, and thank you to all of um, our presenters. We definitely have an all-star cast here today presenting on this topic. Um, personally, I'm ready to enroll in core extension. Um, 
I, I want to preface this by saying I ask this question at basically every curriculum committee meeting for the entirety of the time I've been on the Board of Ed. So it's not meant to be pointed and it's not meant to be personal. Um, it sounds amazing. Is this the ideal? Is this most of the classes or is this all of the classes? Um, I always want to sort of get the landscape before we open it up. Is this where we're trying to head with everything or are we there already? Um, because all of these examples sound fantastic. Do you want me to answer that, Dr. Milley? Um, I'll just say both. I'm, I'm, I think um, everything you saw was real. Uh, I don't think anything was manufactured for this presentation. Um, uh, on the other hand, are there, uh, you, you heard um, uh, Mr. Dowling say that, you know, he changes things up, but they, we all do. Uh, we, we deal with the groups in front of us and I use the word evolve, even though the concept of core extension has evolved. So we're always looking to make it better. I definitely did not mean to apply that this was a really good advertising campaign <laughs> of trumped up things that were not happening. I meant more, obviously there are a ton of core extension classes, right? You're talking about a class from the numbers you showed that touches most of the students in Weber Middle School and um, I'm very clear that it's going to depend on the specific teacher and the subject, and it's going to be different. And some of the selling point is the extreme flexibility. But in terms of this quality of content, of really making it um, used for that goals, for, for goals, um, do you feel like that's happening in the majority of core extension classes? And I'm prefacing it with that because before I open up, because I know that the criticism of core extension has been, well, why do we have study hall when we could have something else? And this certainly looks like something else to me. So is it, is it, is it this for most of the kids, do you think? I, I would say yes. And, and one of the things, you know, we as learners are lifelong learners too. It's not just about our students being lifelong learners. And I think we always, you know, look at our curriculum and see how we could do things better as an educator. I mean, every day, you know, after a presentation, I go over and say, what can I've done differently? And we constantly talk about what we can do differently. And we do that as educators as a whole. Um, we constantly talk about it in teams, but the flexibility part is what also the, the kids bring to us. So it's not cookie cutter. We don't want it to be cookie cutter. We want it to be what kids are bringing to the table. We want it to be flexible. We want to look at it and say, what are these students sitting in front of me? These 100 students, not these 1200 students, but these 100 students that are sitting in front of me, what can we do to meet their needs? And that's what, how we try to, um, to deliver uh, the core extension. The one piece that I didn't say is, one of the things, you know, are schools to watch. And one of the things that they do talk about all the time is this core extension program and the flexibility that it does offer. And the fact that we are meeting students and meeting students needs, um, that it's a wonderful piece of it. And it's, it's written up every single time that we um, get re-designated as a schools to watch. It's one of the things that they think is really, really amazing that we have here that they have not seen in other schools. Thank you. I see we have um, several um, hands up, and one of the one of the things that's not great about this program is it doesn't tell me what order. But I feel like Dr. Hines gets to jump the line no matter what. And so, Dr. Hines, why don't you do it? And, and it. Rachel, if you wouldn't mind if I go after Dr. Hines, just because I do have to leave. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, but I, mine's real quick. Um, thank you for the presentation. And um, who was it, Lean? She, she was she was outrageous. Uh, she was so great. Um, this is I, I know it's not by design. I think it's a systemic flaw. Um, but we have students who are not able to participate in this because they're receiving services, like you said, and doing other things. Any thought as to how we can have students who never get to experience this potentially do this at some point? Um, and I'm sure you've had this conversation already. And it's, and again, I'm just thinking of kids because of their schedules, they have to do these things, um, which I get because they need, they need that support or they're in PEP. Anyway, just thoughts about that because my heart goes out to them after seeing this presentation. So it is year to year. So depending on services and what they get from one year to the next. So um, some students don't get it, unfortunately, because they get other services ever. 
but we try to at least get them to have one, at least one core extension within their three years being here at Weber. Thank you. Go ahead, Beth. Thanks, Rachel. I, I figured you were trying to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so having had three children go through, I did have one um, who went through uh, with what Dr. Hines is ex stating, who never experienced core extension, um, one who had some brief experiences with core extension. But I do want to share a little bit of a story. Um, I don't usually like to do this as a board member to share a personal story, but Dan Dowling mentions, I think it was Dan mentioned something um, that sparked a memory for me and a turning point for my child in middle school that happened to happen during core extension. Um, he had a very rough entry. Uh, we had a lot of issues going into core, go, coming into middle school and a lot of problems, um, many of which have created my absolute hatred for testing. Um, as, as I watch Beth laugh and, and smile because she knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, however, uh, you know, about halfway, three quarters of the way through the school year, his teachers called me and, and they wanted to show me something. And my very quiet child who was having trouble um, sort of socially a little bit and really just struggling to acclimate um, stood up and they, they had presentations in core extension and my very quiet child who everybody, all of his classmates thought was, was this quiet, you know, kid who wouldn't speak much, stood up in front of his class and performed an entire song. Um, loud and proud and they recorded it for me. They had him do it three times because nobody could quite believe that this kid who sat in the corner of the classroom and didn't speak was able to do this. And uh, it, it was a complete turning point for him socially in school. Um, and, and so I, I just wanna say, I mean, it afforded him uh, this opportunity to really come into himself, to have his classmates see who he really was because he does have a physical disability and speech was difficult for him. And that social speech was difficult for him, but he was, he is, and still is, but he's able to project and sing and act when he's focused on that because his neuromuscular condition doesn't sort of interfere. And so it, it completely allowed his classmates to see who he really was and, and totally changed. I believe that one moment in core extension completely changed his school experience. And so I just wanted to state sort of for the record that I know there's some back and forth and some give and take, but I firmly believe um, that allowing this flexibility and this opportunity for people to, for, for students to have different types of interactions and different types of learning experiences that are not predefined by curriculum and that can be sort of directed exactly as as everybody's saying here by the, the 25 kids sitting in that classroom at that moment um, as as a, a former teacher and and a parent uh, I can't think of anything more valuable to give to kids particularly at this transition time and so um, I uh, needless to say a big fan of the program the way it is uh, obviously things can always be improved and I don't think that you guys don't look at things every year and try and improve them but um Mr you know, as, as Dan Dowling said you know it's it's just a valuable opportunity for the teachers and the students to come together and find a different way to educate thank you Beth um I don't know if anybody wants to comment on Beth's comment or add anything to that before I go to the other questions. No, good. All right, I see Emily has her hand up. Thank you. I'm actually gonna build on what uh, Dr. Hines said. And so thank you, first of all, for the presentation. It, um, having had kids that went through Weber a while ago, it's good to see that um, it's still going strong. And um, so, but I'm building on the question because as a board of education, thank you for sharing how curriculum works and how your day is, but we as a board really don't get involved in curriculum, but we do ask questions about how we can help to enhance the curriculum. So, um, and generally that is, the question is, what do you need of us? So Dr. Hines pointed out that there are kids that don't experience core extension. So my question would be, is what can we do to give more, what would be the cost or how, how would it change the makeup or the way Weber looks if we were to give core extension to everyone? What would it be if we eliminated it? So I'm asking for the actual data type of information that may be needed 
and things that you may need from us. So do you need more funding to run it more vibrantly? Do you need, uh, I don't know, I'm asking in general, because that's really where, you know, we don't tell you what curriculum to do or how to run your days and, and how to run your core extension classes. And I think it's wonderful that everybody has, has the flexibility at Weber to do all the things that you guys all said. And I think that's one of the unique things about Weber. What one of the unique things about poor Washington is that we are not a cookie cutter school district. Um, and I think that that's wonderful. And of course your call. So what do you need from us is really the question. How can we help you make it better? Oh, that's a loaded question. I haven't really, I thought of that. Not but, loaded. It's actually yeah, the only uh, thing that really we should be talking about. You know, so, so it's interesting because, you know, just trying to think about, um, you know, Dr. Hines' question is how, you know, how can we, and, you know, the wonderful thing about education is that we support all, right? So we have classes that are for all students, whether, you know, whether they're ENL students, whether they're special ed students, whether they're PEP students, whether they're accelerated students. Our program naturally from, you know, all of our coursework really tries to support all of our students in different ways. Um, and because of that, not everyone gets to have everything, right? But our, but our encore classes are so enriched and give our students a, a vast experience and a great experience to for them to learn different areas. So we have a tech program in the middle school that I have not seen in any other middle schools on Long Island. Um, even our even when we were looking at um, our fax program, like I know the district I live in, kids don't take certain classes because they, they have electives. So they miss out on the instruction that we are giving naturally to every student. Um, so this this other period, you know, connects us to students. Core extension connects us to students in different ways. Um, you know, we do a lot of funding. Thank you again. I know um, I forgot. I think it was Gardner that thanked Ed Foundation, but a lot of our our funding comes from them for these programs, and we try to bring in different activities, whether it's through them, um, in different ways. But I think from a monetary standpoint, we we really are good. The the question is, is there a way to get more kids to be able to have core extension? And that's something we would have to really look at and dive deeper into and figure out how to do it. Um, but our goal is never to take students out of our encore classes. Our first go is to remove them from core extension because that's above and that is above and beyond what the state curriculum gives. And we give such a wonderful experience in our encore classes that we try to forego our core extension first before we let go of our other classes. I don't know if I really answered it, but you know. But Beth, if you don't mind, there's, there's another piece to it. Um, I think a big emphasis that we keep talking about is the connection to the student. And when a student isn't in core extension, if they're in their math workshop, it's with their, their teacher who's a part of the team. If they're in their resource room, it's the resource room and teacher who's connected to the team. And so they're in a different setting, but they're still connecting in a different way um, with those teachers. And they find ways to make it engaging just in a different context. But the getting to know the child, meeting their individual needs, but, you know, connecting them with other students who are in their core group of, of students, uh, you know, their core classes, that's all still happening, just not in the core extension class. And I, can I just add, I don't think my question could have really be answered today. I mean, I, I know, you know, because I think the question is, you know, what do you need more from us? But I'm, I'm saying that as a, I'm asking for us to actually, asking you to look and see, you know, what is it that can make this program better? And what would it, obviously it would cost something, right? It would be a scheduling change. It would somehow, so what would it look like? Um, that's what I think would be helpful to us as board members to see how can we enhance a program that our educators feel is a good program and, and brings value to our students and the connection that you make with our students. So it, clearly you can't say, well, okay, I want, but I think that's the kind of stuff that would be good to, for, to give to us because then that's where we can help you um, in, in ultimately the funding. So, uh, you know, I, I wasn't expecting an answer right now. I think Aunt Molly's question actually could also be expanded to include, you know, if we don't think that this, this um, amazing level of quality that we're seeing is reaching all the goals that Dr. Mioli put there when he popped, 
popped up all of these catchphrases. Um, what could we do there that would help you to make sure that every student in every core extension class is getting this interdisciplinary, connected, engaged learning experience. I think that could be part of Emily's question as well. And I think she's right. It doesn't have to be an answer um, today. It could be just something to think on. Um, I see Dr. Heinz has his hand up again. If it's okay, I, I know Deb's had her hand up for a while and then maybe I'll, you, you sure you don't mind? All right. So. I think you should be able to answer the question. I mean, come on. I'm, I'm totally kidding, Beth. Totally, totally kidding. Um, in all seriousness, um, I think many of us know what Genius Hour is, right? I'm a big fan of Genius, genius Hour, which is different than, than core extension. And, and again, I'm, I'm, it's one thing to potentially consider at some point for those kids maybe who can't make core extension, even though it's not the same. It's not about the two words that Dr. Mealy focused on, but it does allow kids at some point throughout the school year to focus on their own passions and talents and to do things in an interdisciplinary way. But we could chat about that later. Um, but that, it was just one idea that may not cost too much money. And then I'm sure we'll hear about some things that may cost some money. So thank you. Um, Deborah, I think you're next. Thank you. So I'm with Rachel. I want to sign up for core extension. Um, I completely understand the scheduling issues having sat with you for my own child and watched you, Ms. Javelin, try to gerrymander her schedule so that certain things could be moved around because she had competing interests with being up at the high school. And so um, I, if, if there's a way to make sure the kids, all the kids get this experience, I know you will try to find a way to make that happen if it's within your power. I have every confidence in that. Um, the curriculum committee asked for this to be a presentation because we've been hearing a lot of dissatisfaction, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but we've been hearing dissatisfaction from certain community members, witness the petition, um, that core extension was an abject waste of time. And what, what I'm seeing here is something so creative and exciting and mind expanding on so many different levels um, that I really didn't understand what it was and I'm, I'm hoping that community understands now. And I'm wondering, um, is there parity among the, do the kids come out of their houses to do this? Is this like a rain, is this a rainbow course? So they stay within their houses. So as with all things Weber, um, do you have the sense that there is parity among the houses in terms of the experiences that the kids have um, from red house to green house to yellow house to blue house and within the different disciplines. Um, I think Rachel had asked this, but mine is more specific. Is this really indicative of everything going on within all the houses? Because sometimes we, we say there's disparity among the houses. This one's doing a research project, this one isn't. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious to know if, if, um, if there is some type of parity in terms of the richness and the, the flexibility and the, the relationships and the relevance. So I definitely say relationships are built in every single team. It's one of the, if we didn't have teaming in this middle school, I don't think we would be successful, honestly. It, it, it is a large, large middle school. And the whole point of the team structure and the house structure is so we can connect to kids. So, um, you know, in, in sixth grade, it starts with just your team and we're learning who they are. And then the AP, the guidance counselor, and the social worker and the psychologist move with them to the next level. So we create family relationships with them as administrators and mental health staff. And that goes, you know, forth from, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade and eighth grade. So that that's really important from that standpoint. And if we you know, we try to build a lot on classes for teaming because that is how we do our connection. So we have five periods in a day that's a team-based class. And then we have four periods of, a, of classes that are not team-based. So, you know, almost a little less, you know, more than 50%, I guess, just, to, you know, is, is team-based. And the purpose of that is so we can connect to students and we can know about them and we can, you know, relate to them and learn about them and work with them and find their, their weaknesses and find their strengths and, and grow with them and push them in ways that they aren't necessarily pushed. And a lot of times, what the teachers learn in core extension will carry over into the classroom because you know what they can do in a core extension setting 
um, without a grade, without the pressure. And we as teachers will know that, oh, they we know they could do that. So we could push them a little harder in, in a you know social studies class or an English class. Um, as far as is it the same, it is not the same across the board. Do I expect the same richness across the board? I do. And the only way um, if someone is upset with a specific teacher, no different than if they're upset with a teacher in a social studies classroom, the only way we could improve education is if we know about it. So if it's a blanket statement that this is not happening across the building, I, that's not true. If it's one or two staff members that someone has a complaint about, they should. the parents really need to call that teacher, find out what they're doing. Um, you know, Mr. Dowling mentioned he shows a movie, 1776, but that he is showing the movie. That's 100% right. He is showing that movie, but he is stopping. He is discussing, you know, so unless you really have a conversation with the teacher to know exactly what and why they're doing something, it, it's hard to make a judgment about what's going on and not going on. Um, but it's not the same, but I would, I would expect the same richness throughout the building. Um, I see Dr. Mioli with his hand up. So Julie, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna let Dr. Mioli go and then Julie. We need you to unmute though, Dr. Mioli. I, I put my hand down instead. Uh, see how good I am at technology. I, I said Julie, Julie can go <laughs> if she'd like, she's been waiting. We're so polite. I actually was after you, Dr. Muley. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to thank um, Ms. Javelin, Mr. Ciccone, Mr. Dallin, Ms. Lindstad, Mr. Gart, Mr. Smith, um, and also Helene for putting together this presentation. Uh, I, I appreciated so much how you also focused on the student voice in this, not only from the actual student, but in showcasing their work. I think that's really important for a board for us to see from the perspective. Uh, that, that's the work that we also do, right? Looking out for the student and what the student likes and what the student enjoys. I kind of want to piggyback onto what Emily was asking just in framing it. Um, also at looking at your presentation from a board perspective, I appreciated um, this year as a board, we said that we wanted to see that social emotional learning was implemented within our curriculum. And what I saw through core extension is that you showcased social emotional learning fitting into that curriculum and being integrated in a seamless manner to deliver what's necessary to these students. And without that, it may not be as easy to implement it. So as a board member looking at this and asking the question of what resources you need, it would definitely be within alignment with our board goals to say, if this is an opportunity to you know, enhance social emotional learning throughout a busy day, and that's gonna provide a great skill set to our students and help them prepare and you know, complete our portrait of a graduate, I would just ask that you all keep that in consideration when you're evaluating and continue to evolve with core extension. So I don't really have a, a, a statement. I have more of a statement than I do a question, but maybe a consideration to be taken and also to thank you for helping kind of marry into our board goals as well. Dr. Muley, did you want to say something? I did. I want to say actually a couple of things. I'm glad I went. I let Julie go first because um, she set the table for one of them. J just a couple of follow ups. I want to, I, I can say a little stronger than Beth than uh, uh, what Beth said um, in, a, in a little stronger way. Um, you know, look, we're all human um, and um, uh, there are things that are happening at SUSE way better than they were last year um, when they got rid of that old principal. Um, and there, um, you know, there are probably some things um, that aren't going so well. So it's a human endeavor and um, it's really important. I, I'm glad that that um, these great educators were able to show you the value of this so many years later, because it is a very valuable paradigm. Um, and if it isn't being, um, you know, as consistent as it should be, um, you know, I, I, that's something that you can bring to uh, Ms. Javelin's attention and to my attention. And so that's, you know, that, that's just something I'm just going to say. Um, two, there were there. I, I think part of the criticism that I've heard is is the numbers piece. Uh, Ms. Javelin put uh, some numbers up there, and I, I just want to put a quick lens on that. Um, the reason that in the core extension there are so few kids, it, relatively speaking, is because the rest of the kids are 
in places where they would normally be pulled out of classes. So uh, they're in PEP, they're in resource room, they're in all those other places. Um, so it's really a false uh, sense of numbers because if if we didn't show those numbers, if we just had classes of you know 29, um, you wouldn't see that kids were leaving that classroom like Ant Hill uh, every five minutes to go to here, there, and everywhere. Um, so it, it's really not at all it really doesn't have anything at all to do with numbers of kids being in classrooms and being um, educated. So I, I just wanna briefly bring that up too. And finally, um, and most importantly for me, since I am um, assistant superintendent for curriculum, I, I wanna say something that, um, that I think plays to what I've heard just about everybody here see, uh, say. And I wanna focus on the word pressure. You heard the teacher saying it, you heard the student saying it, you heard the principal saying it. And the answer to the question for you as a board and to me as an assistant superintendent as, and to Dr. Hines and to all of us is, you know, there's this great yin yang in education. There's this great yin that we want our kids to learn as much as possible and succeed and get into great colleges. And, and there's stuff that they have to know and they have to get through to do that. And the other is we want them to learn to be people we want them to learn to be, um, you know, wonderful neighbors and and wonderful educators and and professionals and everything else, and um, and it's really important that at this point in time, especially, we look at shifting that yang a little bit and trying as much as we can to take a little bit of the pressure off, so that some of these things can happen without all of the standards and the regulations and the uh, and all of the things that come down on us in education. And I know, um, you know, this is not a dissertation, but it's a really important point because that's why we're doing mission and vision. We're looking at where we want our kids to end up and building it backwards. That's why we're looking at the way that we're doing things. That's why I was very happy that you asked us uh, to do a whole series this year on curriculum instruction and assessment so we could really um, parse out what those are. So that pressure piece is something, you know, you've got, we've got a lot of great educators who, who have to do a lot of things from a lot of sources. And if we can pull back, I think you see what can happen when we can take a little bit of that pressure away, maybe a little bit more than a little bit. Um. I have an additional question and then Deborah, I'll let you go too. Um, so Mrs. Javelin and Dr. Mealy, you both said that, you know, like anything, there might be consistency issues. And if there are, the parent should contact you. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, as a parent, when your kid is signed up for math or science or English or whatever, you have not all parents, right? But many parents have some framework of what they expect. And with the things they're seeing at home, um, they know when to say, wait a second, I'm not seeing what I expect in this class. Maybe I should reach out to the principal. What are the parents told about core extension and what should be happening in core extension? Because it seems to me that a prerequisite for even thinking you should reach out is um, knowing what you think you should be seeing. I mean, I imagine that there are people who reach out to you anyway. <laughs> But what, what do parents know about core extension? What kind of communication comes from um, Weber about it? What are they told should be, should be in the class? So I'm back to school night. All the teachers talk about their core extension program. So it's a, you know, this parents go through a scheduled period by period. So core extension is one of the classes that they attend. So they hear about it at back to school night. And I would also, if it, just in general, if you are concerned about it, reach out to the teacher that's on the child's schedule and they'll be more than happy to explain what they are doing during their core extension. Uh, Deborah, I think you're next up. Yeah, it's really just a comment as I was, I was trying to put my finger on it and I realized this is really project-based learning um, at its core, I'd say. And I think kids love doing projects and I think they learn really, really 
there's a different type of learning that goes on when they're involved in a project and they're enthusiastic about the project and they're vested in the project. But it's also a form of structured and unstructured play. I mean, as I was watching every single one of these videos, I said, this is, these kids are having fun. There's so much fun. And they're really, they're playing, they're learning, but they're playing and they don't really realize that they're learning while they're playing. Um, so it was just an observation I wanted to share more than a question. I could be completely wrong, but to me, this is what it looks like. It just reminds me of what, what my daughter did in preschool, but on a more sophisticated level because it's middle school. So um, I think it's great. I really do change, change my perspective completely. So thank you all. Um, I see it. Does anybody else? Um, Rachel, oh, sorry. Emily, go ahead. Your hand yeah, just, just come quickly up. because I think you asked a question about structure or I, I isn't the whole point of core extension as I understood it so that there's flexibility amongst the grades and amongst the classes. And so that, I mean, if one of the key things is to get to know your students and to have the ability to develop relationships, wouldn't it be something that is not as structured, you know, with a set curriculum, I, I'm guessing that, you know, uh, Dan, I guess you can answer this question. You, you have a time frame of things that you want to go through or in a general idea of the subjects that you'd like to achieve. But my impression of core extension is that it is this opportunity to be flexible and, and get more of it. So I don't know how much structure there is or how much it is going to be the same across all grades or all all, class, all teachers even, right? I guess that's my question or statement. I don't know what it is. But I saw nodding of heads. You don't talk to Mr. Head. Dowling, right? When you wanted him to respond. But I think that's right. I think you, you come in with the idea of what you want to teach and then the kids drive it, right? So, you know, he's bringing in current events articles and the kids are allowed to go on a tangent and ask about what they what's on their mind and he will go with it because it's, it, this is where it starts and then the kids drive where it goes. Um, you know, as far as the research projects, the teacher gives the guidelines, like this is what I want you to do, water, you know, and then how do you go about doing it and they pick their own topics. So there is, it, it's exactly right, it's flexible and it's meant to be flexible for reasons. If, you know, Dan's noticing a lot of the kids on his on his social studies test are, are not doing well and um, the instructions being taught, but they're, they're voicing, they don't know how to study he's gonna stop his plan and, and start doing some study skills because that's the need of the kids. So that's where the flexibility really comes in. So it's not going to be cookie cutter across the board because we're working with the 100 kids that are in front of us, not the 1200 or not the 400 per grade level. It's really the 100 kids that we're, we're teaching, right? That's you know in front of us. Yeah, I didn't always have this in mind when I first became a teacher, but I did have some uh, veteran teachers that I worked with when I first got, especially when I first got to Weber, who would always remind me, there's always a tomorrow, right? So if you don't, you know, you don't have to rush through things. And, um, you know, as Mrs. Javelin just said, it's, it's better to get it right based on who's in front of you than to rush through things. Uh, and then, you know, they're not getting as much out of it or they're feeling pressured, right? Because they get that sense from, from us, right? If we're, you know, kind of the guides in the room and where, you know, we look anxious, well, they're going to feel a little bit more anxious. The students are going to feel a little bit more anxious in the classroom also. And we want to keep that, that, level, uh, that level down, uh, especially in core extension. Just to clarify, Emily, are you saying that I said structure? I think we were, I, I think I asked if that, that was the assumption. I think you said something, didn't you say something about uh, how are teachers telling the, about how are parents finding out about, about, right? Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify, I didn't mean like in, in seventh grade math, we cover the following topics. I meant, look, we've had a really robust description here today of what, what something that is flexible and free looks like. Um, but I mean, to my mind, part of a little bit of the paradox of education sometimes is that to create this kind of environment for children, you have teachers in the background who are actually being very methodical and have specific goals in mind. It's not just, 
we arrived and now we're going to talk. I mean, what we heard today was things that a lot of work goes into to create a project-based environment where kids can lead the way, but the teachers know the framework of where they are and what they're trying to create. So when I said, what are the parents told about the structure of this? I meant more all of this communicated to parents, you know, so that parents know um, to, I think it's twofold, right? Parents who are seeing something that is inconsistent know to reach out, but also the parents know to keep an, an eye out and understand that something amazing might be happening in this period of time that they don't understand. Um, so it, I think it, it's both from my end of things. Um, Dr. Hines, do you wanna jump in? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll be brief. I, you know, Beth talked about this before about, you know, how there's an award because, you know, because um, schools to watch because part of it, because we offer this. I, I've seen, I've been around many, many middle schools in different school districts. I haven't seen this. Maybe some iteration of this. Maybe it's, you know, they, they'll do it for a month or they'll try something new and different, but this is part of the schedule. This is part of the DNA and the fabric of Weber. And I, I know Deb talked about um, this is uh, project-based. It's also problem-based instruction, which to me is the highest level when you integrate play, as Deb said too. Um, it's really the highest form of, I think, learning. And it does stick with you. It stays with you. This is not like a scratch and sniff. You learn something, you pour something into a kid's head, they regurgitate it in the test and then it's gone. This is the highest level of learning. And even though it's, it's disguised as play, there is a lot of great stuff going on. And I think as Dan uh, said, and certainly Dr. Mioli said, on top of it, you're layering, layering this with relationships. And that's the beauty of it. And like anything else that we do in our school district, it will continue to evolve. It won't stay static. A teacher will have a new and different idea as far as moving this forward. Other teachers learn from other teachers. I know I certainly do all the time. I learn from other administrators. Um, and that's that's the beauty of this. So where we are right now is, is, is a good place. I, I project, you know, two to three years from now, it'll be even better because our teachers get better and our students get smarter. And our job is to support this. So I just want to end with that. Thank you. Um, I see I have a uh, question from one of our attendees, um, Rose Borda. I think, Emily, do you have the controls to unmute? Oh, hold on. Yeah, you should be you should be able to speak now. Hi, do you hear me? We hear you. Well, okay, great, great. Thank you. My name is Rose Borda. Um, I'm uh, one of the members in, of uh, Concerned Parents, and we were a group of parents that did do the petition. Our goal, and our, and it still is, is the, our goal is to replace core extension with uh, real electives. And I'd like to explain a little bit what I mean by that. Um, you know, we, we talk about funding and money in Port Washington, in this case, as we speak about poor extension, is not the, the issue is not money. Core extension itself is a $1.2 million program that we offer at the middle, at the middle school. And there are districts on Long Island that do not, cannot afford to offer electives to uh, their students. They basically have an eight period day. Uh, Mineola, for example, is one of them. I don't know if Dr. Hines' previous district had uh, electives like this at, the, at their middle school. So when we're looking at a program like this, you know, and we know that money is absolutely no option, we, 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 have, to ex we have to have a certain standard of expectation. And, and that expectation comes from various parts. If it's, if it's not coming from the administrators, uh, if it's not coming from the board, then it really it requires the parents to speak up. But we hope that it could be a partnership. Uh, and, and it is the role, I have to say, of the Board of Education to maybe not dictate, oh, I want you to teach this elective at the middle school, but it is their purview to, to oversee the structure. And the problem is that 
this isn't an issue where a, a parent can go to Miss Javelin and say, my core extension teacher is not doing anything because that's not going to happen. That's not going to work. And it's not, it's not, a, pro it's not a problem that Miss Javelin can fix because it's inherently a structural problem that you have with core extension at the middle school. And it's a very serious problem, costing very serious problem. And let me explain why. Um, core extension on a structural level, if we spend this amount of money on, a, on an elective program for students, number one, parents have to know what it is that their child is doing. There needs to be a description of what is happening in that classroom in the course guide. So, for example, I, I loved what the teachers presented. I mean, I thought that was excellent. Um, so, for example, if you have someone like, like Mr. Dowling's uh, uh, core extension, that could be struggle in history and a description could be placed. I mean, a true elective program gives children a choice. What if I don't want to have, um, you know, a discussion on history? Or, you know, it's not a theme that I, I'm interested in, but I'm interested in coding. I'm interested in yoga. Um, you know, I could look at the description with my child and we could choose first, second and third choice. So there's some choice involved. And yes, it is an exploratory program. This is an age where children should be exploring different things. Um, for example, it, it's not about grades. It should continue to be pass fail. There shouldn't be any homework involved. There should be. But I just look all our neighboring schools, uh, North Shore, Great Neck North, Great Neck South, Comac. Um, uh, Jericho, Sayaset, they all have a listing of all the electives that they offer their, their students in the course guide and, pa and parents and students get to choose. For example, if I just look at, um, I'm looking here, I'm looking at, uh, this is uh, North Shore Middle School. Uh, I think seventh and eighth graders can choose from coding and electronics, Mythbusters, Renewable Revolution, Creative Writing. Um, they can choose criminal justice, documentary filmmaking, um, uh, public speaking and debate. That's just one middle school and that's just seven and eight because they combine the classes and it's a rainbow elective. Uh, sixth grade students um, in the COMAC can choose from building and beyond, creative connections, digital media, gaming and coding. Uh, and there's a description, all these come with description. So there is an inherently, when we have a $1.2 million program with no accountability, you're going to have some people that might have classes that are teaching like Mr. Dowling. And then you have those people who aren't, who choose to decide to make this a free, uh, free period. I also want to correct something. It, the, the number of students in these classes, it's, it's a board decision. Uh, do you want to accept, do you want to create classes with 11 students, 17, 16, 15? And it's not an issue of kids are being pulled out. Those students, that, that core extension A day class with 11 students has 11 students. It does not have 16 students because four have been pulled out. The students who are, who are in AIS are already scheduled at the beginning of the year for AIS on A day. They're not scheduled for core extension on that day. So they're not being pulled out of any class. Same thing with PEP. If you're in PEP in sixth grade, you have core extension on, you have an A day and maybe in PEP on B day. You're not being pulled out of core extension. So when you create a master schedule, you look at the number of students you have, and then you decide on the number of sections that you need. Nor, but at our middle school, it's difficult to create the, it's difficult to create the master schedule simply because the master, the person doing the master schedule has a lot of restriction. Um, all core extension students in seventh grade have to take core extension with uh, a teacher in core extension and with other seventh graders. If you make core extension a seven and eight rainbow elective, and there's no reason why seventh and eighth grade students can't be together, and in, in a uh, um, seventh and eight and a rainbow elective where they're with students from other um, other classes, other houses, uh, and same thing with sixth grade. Uh, you're going to be able to uh, have an easier time creating sections with at least having a minimum of 20, 20 students per section. And I would like to say there's also a savings in FTEs. Um, and there is, unfortunately, if you are an, a student who's in resource room and AIS, it is difficult to take core extension. That's why it's very important to have a rich after school program. So what, I, what we're asking for and uh, concerned parents is we want to work with, and this is a working session of uh, the curriculum committee. We would like we would like to work, have a, a committee set up that reports back to the uh, uh, 
uh, curriculum committee meeting, and we would we would like to visit, have a group of a, a committee of parents, administrators, teachers visit North Shore Middle School. They have an amazing elective program where kids actually have a choice, and a description, and there's a syllabus. Uh, visit Comac Middle School. I think it's it's well worth our effort. Um, and also it comes up to an equity issue. There are students in our district who can take a coding class after school. Why can't we offer it during the day? So, and, op and ultimately open it up core extension classes to other departments as well. I would love, some kids would love to take a baking class. I mean, it's just endless the possibilities if we could just, you know, open our mind to this. We've had this for 20 years, or I don't know, I didn't hear the beginning but it's, it's time for a change. And it is up to the board if the direction isn't coming from the, from the administrators in our district to set the direction and to, uh, to set the course because uh, nothing is going to change or get better until we decide to replace the whole, to replace core extension and begin the process of creating a true core, uh, true electives that are put in the course catalog for parents to choose. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, do any of the administrators want to respond to, to any of that? I actually have a question, um, Rachel. Because there were a lot of things that Rose brought up. And to me, it sounded like all these ideas that she has may cost us more than 1.2 million where that she's quoting the number. So um, I guess I, I don't know where, where all that comes from, I get is really my question. And I, and I, and it was my understanding based on what the presentation we heard today is that, and we do have, we, there are, AIS is being handled through core extension. PEP is being handled through core extension. Uh, double skip math is being handled through core extension. So we're hearing conflicting uh, information. I don't know where, Rose has her information from, um, but I just, that's just my, I, I guess I'm getting conflicting information is what I'm saying. I didn't hear the conflicting information there. Didn't, didn't uh, you say that we, that they're, they're not, that core extension, Rose, you're still there. Did you not say that core extension is not be, being, you know, it's not because of AIS or? No, I mean, what, what, I'm, um, what I'm trying to say is when you're building the master schedule, Mm -hmm. the, the middle school knows the number of students that they have to put into core extension and they have separate sections of AIS classes. So the district is already paying a separate for the AIS classes. They have sections for AIS, they have sections for PEP and they have sections for core extension and all those and all each section comes with a cost because it's point one of a teacher's schedule. Okay. So hold so, on. So, so, Beth, so Beth, can you actually, um, Give us the right. So on average, through. on average, core extension is at least twenty students. Um, there are times where it may be eleven, but there's a reason why we would choose to make it a, a class at that size. Um, you know, you as board of ed, um, you we get our sure. you get our numbers in the beginning of the year of the numbers that are under and over. Um, when looking at the other districts, because I have looked at the other districts and asked about their elective program, they give up. So not every student takes what they take at Weber Middle School. So we offer, our Encore program offers for every student to get an experience in all of our Encores. So in cooking, in technology, in um, family consumer science, this way they can make a better judgment as high school students on what choices they wanna make in classes. But we do offer coding through our tech program. We do offer aerodynamics, et cetera, cooking, sewing through all of our Encore programs. We have a very, very rich Encore program. Um, and when speaking with the other schools, um, students that take earth science don't get to choose an elective because they have to take a lab. So they are giving up other things. Not every student takes electives in the other schools um, that Ms. Border uh, mentioned, because I've spoken to Comac, I've spoken to Northport, I've spoken to Great Neck, I've spoken to Half Hollow Hills, I've spoken to many different schools trying to understand the elective program, um, knowing that parents were asking about it, I wanted to be more informed about it. Um, and I really do very strongly believe that we offer, every single student, we offer them 
a rich experience in all topics and not just target them into just coding because that's what their interest is now as an adolescent. As we know, adolescent brains grow quickly. They are sometimes altered by what their friends want or where their parents want. And we really strongly believe that students need to learn about everything before they can make that decision on what they're really truly interested in. And if you go back to you know all of us and when we go to college, many students don't even go to college with a, a direction on where they wanna go because they're learning who they are and what their interests are. And until you really know what your interests are, I think it's hard to pick just and target yourself and go in this area without really experiencing learning everything. Thank you. I know we're um, a little bit over, usually we go an hour and a half, um, but I see Dr. Hines has his hand up. Um, so go ahead, Dr. Hines, and then maybe we'll try and wrap it up. Yeah, definitely. Um, Beth really took 95% of what I was about to say. So thank you for, for doing that. You said it a lot better than I would. And I appreciate Rose's uh, perspective uh, because there are two really two different philosophies here, right? There, there is I want to say a standard approach to offering electives where students are locked in for a half year or for a full year, depending on what the schedule looks like. And then there's this way of looking at um, having kids experience something new and different. And I go back to relationships and relevance and the flexibility, all those different things. And as Deb said, you know, the project based problem based learning that takes place as well. And so you know, I, I've, I've worked in middle schools um, that have that traditional elective, you know, with the syllabus and everything else and, and knowing what to expect. I, and I, I appreciate that, but I really appreciate what we have here. Um, and as I said before, uh, we can continue to grow it. We can continue to expand it and to make it better than what it is right now, because that's what we want to do in, in every different place. And, and again, um, to the teachers, to our student who spoke today, can't thank you enough for doing that and taking the time out of your very busy day. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Um, I have two um, hands up from the attendees and we haven't had a lot of community comment. Do you all mind if we if we ask them to be brief? Is that okay if we stay for another minute? I can stay for another minute. Okay. Um, I see GGB, which I think is George Borda, but- No, I, I gave Kim Kaiserman access. So like- Kim Oh. I'm sorry. Thank you. I don't see her hands up. I think she took it down after you. I took it down from her. Kim, did you want to say Emily? Kim, you've been unmuted. Perhaps she doesn't want to talk anymore. Kim. Um, hi, it's Kim. Are you guys calling on me? Yes, we are. Did you I have didn't your raise hand my hand? <laughs> I did not raise my hand. Okay, your hand was up. Sorry, we'll take it I down. I don't know what happened. No sorry word. about that. Most I didn't see it either. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Two hands up, George, George and, and Kim's. Okay, bye. Um, I will go back to, uh, it's actually not, okay, here we go. George, uh, okay. George has got access. Yeah, good morning. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Mioli for his historical presentation. Having been a social studies teacher, I can appreciate some of that history. And certainly the teachers made a wonderful presentation. It makes me, I'm sold on core extension. So I might be asking for my son to be transferred from his present house to the blue house because the experiences there from what we saw were amazing. You know, the fact is that and I, I'm not speaking only for my son, but many friends and many residents here in Port Washington have not had the same experience in the court extension classes. And I heard something about talking about cookie cutter education. Well, no one wants really cookie cutter education, but whatever they make the cookies, and I, I want to be speaking only for my son here, you know, he's only getting the crumbs. Um, you know, I have a, a lo uh, long and large experience on schools, school structure, middle schools, master schedules. All uh, that I think people are talking is whatever you do is equity. 
No one can guarantee uh, equal results, but they do want equity and an approach to being able to receive a, a relatively similar experience. I'm not gonna go here and go into all the different, uh, you know, things that I could, uh, many of you have received the, uh, the documents and, and complaints about this, but, you know, so something has to change because it's not just my my complaints or my wives or my my friend it, there is a, a a sentiment here that a lot of kids are not getting the the uh, what they they should be getting uh, all i have to say is that the question is where do we go from here it seems to me that uh I guess we will just continue uh, continue doing the same thing. I mean, Dr. Heinz talks about play and great. Core extension should be one of those places where kids maybe do meditation, yoga, play. Core extension is a paid curriculum period. And it has to have a structure to some extent, not a cookie cutter structure because it is being uh, paid. So um, I just feel really like things are just going to continue because it's the same way is, is just what it is. Maybe, um, look, my son should be changed from his house to a different house and he'll have a wonderful experience. And I'll return here and I will say, you know, I will say the most wonderful things because his experience is such and such. Again, I'm repeating, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for a lot of people that we know. And it's just not fair. It is not fair. And it is really up to the adults in the room, the administrators. And I don't blame the teachers. The Board of Education that has been elected Dr. Hines, who has very good ideas about education. What are you going to do for, not for me? I don't want any favors. What are we going to do for a, a large segment of our, of our students who are in, I don't know, educational limbo when it comes to core extension? You know, Thoreau, if I remember correctly, said, people just live lives of quiet desperation. People don't want to complain. They want to go to the principal and maybe annoy the teacher. And in the middle school, you have this team approach, which is wonderful. But if you have an issue, a particular specific issue with the teacher, then the entire team has to come. No, if I want to talk to Dr. Mioli because he's the music teacher, I just want to talk to him about my son's piano playing, whatever, trumpet. Why do I need to be I, for that specific reason with the rest of the team. I do understand in some, sometimes you need to bring the whole team around, but I think that that's being used sometimes to intimidate parents because they don't want to do that. They don't want to go into the school and have to face all these teachers. And, 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 and that has been our experience. Again, I, I don't know what to say in terms of you know, we came to Port Washington and we are educators. You know, the Board of Education here knows us for a long time. We have a lot of experience in education, K through 12. I was in, in the city in a school reform and we broke up a lot of the very large New York City schools into houses. And we had to work with master schedules that were ridiculously complex. It can be done. Um, Thank you, George, um, for your comments. I really appreciate them. I know that the administrators also appreciate hearing from the public. Um, I know we're we're way over. Um, if anybody is watching this um, live streamed, or if anybody is watching this later and you have more questions or comments, you're always welcome to email the entire Board of Education boe at portnet.org. And I know the administrators um, also welcome emails and with questions and comments. 
Dr. Mealy, I saw your hand up before. Did you want to say one final thing to wrap this up? I might as well get the last word in <clears throat> since I can't do the flag. Um, <laughs> I, I think the um, I think I have a takeaway. I have three takeaways. One, I want to echo what Dr. Hines and several of you said and thank uh, Beth and her team and the teachers. Um, it was a great job. Um, and I, I'm, I was glad to hear, and I mean this sincerely, not uh, that, that I was glad to hear uh, George say that he was sold on the idea because the idea is a great idea. Um, I think um, also what you said, Rachel, was very important. I think we need to do, I need to do a better job, not Beth, she's got to run a school. I think I need to do a better job of, of this, of getting this across to the community, of showing what we're doing. Uh, and I will, um, and I think, uh, and we, you know, we, I think it's a good to have this kind of discussion. Um, and if we believe that this is a good paradigm, and I, and and I very happily heard almost everybody say that at one point or another, um, then we need to um, we need to cherish it, and we need to keep what's good, and we need to make um, what may not be as good better. And and so both of those things kind of fall under my bailiwick. Um, thank you for that. I think you've tied everything up. Um, to all our teachers and administrators, we really appreciate you coming and being here and um, giving a, us a very detailed perspective on the subject. Um, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you again. All right, thank you. <laughs>